All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you guys for joining. Do you want to just start by sharing a little bit about who you are and how you end up at Supply Pike? Stacey, we can start with you. Yeah, awesome. Happy to start. Hello, everybody. My name is Stacey Tan. I'm the VP of Retail Insights at Supply Pike. I've spent a long time in the supplier world before joining the company. My background is in supply chain replenishment and sales. And obviously at Supply Pike, I kind of help a lot with the deductions and rev loss side of the business. But yeah, I started really in product development. I've worked with different suppliers over the last 12 years now, crazy to say. Started there, did a lot of sourcing work, a lot of pricing, used to travel internationally fairly frequently. Did that for about four or five years. And then before joining Supply Pike, it's been another four or five years as a national account manager. So calling directly on Walmart and Sam's Club, doing all that fun stuff, fielding buyer emails and calls and coordinating those teams. And yeah, joined Supply Pike about four years ago. It'll be four years in July. Also crazy to say. And my job is, again, leading the retail insights team. So I really sit in between the suppliers we support as well as the internal teams here at Supply Pike. My team's job is to make sure we are keeping basically a finger on the pulse of what is going on in the world in retail. As I'm sure many of your listeners know, it is changing all the time, every day. Retailers keep us on our toes. So it's our job to make sure that we are translating everything that we're hearing outside to the relevant teams internally. So product team, sales team, marketing team, so on and so forth. But yeah, love being a supply bike. Yeah. And I've been a little bit newer to the company, but technically not new to the company. So I'm a retail insights manager on Stacy's team, having joined back in January now, but I actually was a former client. So I worked for Harry's, the CPG company, managing and starting the function of revenue recovery for them on the supply chain organization. So really learning soup to nuts, everything about the world of deductions and compliance for all of the retailers that we managed at that point was probably around 40 to 50 retailers. My background really across the supply chain organization within planning, distribution, allocation, project management, have worked at D2C brands. I've worked for Nike and Converse, really got to see the wholesale side as well as direct-to-consumer side. So I think between Stacy and I, it's really helpful to round out, I think, our experience with really working with the suppliers and trying to help them understand revenue recovery and how we can basically help make their businesses more profitable, especially as we know the world of retail and supply chain can be very messy <laughs> in today's world. But yeah. Just a little bit. A lot of the brands that we work with are D2C at their core. They That's where they started. And now they're expanding into retail or want to expand into retail. I think, Jessica, we start with you. Can you just talk about how the customer journey is different for an e-commerce company versus a retail company? Definitely. I think e-commerce is a little bit more complex in that you need to find out who your brand is and really put out that signature of who you are in a different way from a marketing perspective. I think really having the core of what your product is and what that is really going to resonate with the customer. I really find that it's done a lot of brands well to stamp out their signature and who their product is, find their customer in the D2C side, and then expand to the retail side, have that brand recognition, and then to join the world of retail is a little bit different. But I think as we know, Retailers are constantly changing the brands that they're bringing into their organizations daily. But depending on what their strategies are, we know we want to see those organic brands or we want to see brands that are going to be super trendy, depending on what that is in the fashion world. And I think really being more creative is something that is extremely important to be able to resonate with the specific retailers in which you're looking to launch your brand and how you actually resonate with those customers specifically. And I think on the e-commerce side, you're creating a product that you believe in. When you merge into that world of retail, it's really trying to find how you connect with those individual customers at each specific retailer. So that can be challenging, but I think there's easy ways to adapt to that, whether that be packaging, labeling, pricing, promotional things. From a marketing perspective, I think the teams have done a really great job in being able to speak to each of those customers in a different way. That's great. Stacey, you've been obviously on the retail side. How do you see the best brands leveraging what they've done in D2C and bring it into the retail space? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question and wanted to add on to what Jessica was saying. I think on the e-commerce D2C side, you have a lot more freedom 
classic say, this is our brand. This is who we are. This is our story. And I think a lot of the big kind of mass merchandisers appreciate that, but you also, to Jessica's point, really have to learn to massage that story to really fit the target demographic of each particular retailer that you're trying to go into. So really easy, funny. We were literally just talking about target demographics at retailers this morning for a different series. Mm -hmm. And for example, the average shopper at Walmart is going to be a 60 year old woman in the suburbs who is white and married and has children. And so how do you make sure that you're really catering your brand voice to hit that target demographic for the retailer? So I think the best advice that I would give is understanding when you're taking your brand into kind of that retail brick and mortar world is there's going to be a lot more push and pull. So I will say having a really strong brand voice is usually how you attract retailers' attentions. So as Jessica mentioned, a lot of times buyers will have their specific strategy that they're trying to accomplish for the year. So as an example, they could say, hey, we really want to grow our organic share of voice within this category. Or, hey, we really want to go after the Gen Z customer this year or whatever it is. So you start by having a really strong brand voice. That's how you get their attention. That's how they find out about you. And then once you're through the door and they're like, hey, this is really cool. We like what you stand for. Then you start to have that back and forth relationship of, hey, this is really great. We understand your message and we understand where you're coming from. How do we cater that pack size or that packaging or that branding or your ads or whatever it is, again, to make sure that it's resonating with the target demographic for each of those retailers. So starting with a really strong kind of brand voice and then being willing to push and pull with the buying teams, I think. Yeah, I think that point about the brand voice is really an important one. One of the things I usually tell companies is that you build a brand in D2C and you build a business in retail. And it's really interesting when you think about all marketing is effectively the same. This is a supply chain guy talking about marketing. <laughs> but effectively, you boil it down to traffic times conversion equals sales. I think in D2C, it's the traffic is the hard part, right? That's why you give money to Google and Facebook, but you're typically pretty good on the conversion piece. Whereas with retail, they have the traffic and you've got to try to figure out the conversion parts. And so I think that the brands that are able to hone their message to bring in that traffic from a D2C perspective and really develop that strong brand voice and be able to communicate why someone should purchase their product on shelf. That's really the winning combination. I see people that it's not about a D2C brand going into retail. It's really about a D2C brand becoming omnichannel. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. And to your point, Aaron, I mean, it's exactly like what you're saying. When I click on an ad, I go to the website. You are not competing with anyone else. There's no noise. You have the buyer's full attention. I like to give the cereal aisle example at Walmart. Like I did not know <laughs> there could be like 80 different cereal brands, but there they all are. And so your ability to stand out from everyone else. And again, having that strong brand voice. And as you said, convincing people to make that conversion in person is really important. Yeah. Jessica, going back to Harry's, and they famously made that pivot from digitally native, only e-commerce to first target and then expanding elsewhere. Yep. What were some of the main challenges or learning that Harry's learned when it came from transitioning to e-commerce only to omnichannel? I think just we were super excited to expand and I think we did it very quickly. And I think as the former revenue recovery manager, I think we paid a price, honestly, from a supply chain perspective. I think just not knowing how much we were going to need to fulfill specific retailers or how long our lead times were going to be and really trying to understand the compliance and the complexity of the logistics side of the business. I think we were happy to do it and we did it successfully from a business perspective, but I think some of that effects of the supply chain compliance hit us later on, which we learned quickly that, you know, they're going to hold you to a higher standard, obviously on the retail side. So, you know, the on time and in full of the Walmarts of the world and understanding that there is a level that they expect you to perform in the supply chain world. And that if you don't, you're literally going to pay that and it's going to impact your PL overall for your business. So I think that was a little bit tough for us. And obviously from a supply planning perspective, making sure that we are at an optimal inventory position. And if that made sense to each retailer specifically and how we were going to do that. So I think that's probably for me, my main <laughs> takeaway from it is just making sure we had enough inventory. If we're going to be standing for a product 
and really putting that out there in the market that we were actually going to be able to fulfill the demand that was there across the retailer base, as well as just not being afraid to take risks. I think from a product perspective as well, just going back to what we were discussing before, like not every product that's your bread and butter on your website and DSC side is going to be the same on the Walmart and Target side. And that's okay. I think it's, that's the big learnings that we should be comfortable with in the beginning when we're launching is who is that customer and how do we learn who they are and how do we serve them in a different way than maybe that D to C customer. So just taking that away and really being okay and comfortable with who that customer is, like, who is my target customer? And they may not want the same razor (laughs) that we're selling on the website. Okay, cool. Let's create something else for them and let them know that we're there for them in a different way than we would be on the D2C side. Yeah. As you were sharing that, I could think of a few companies that I've worked with where they were so excited to get into retail and things didn't go exactly the way they thought to either the retailer didn't order enough and then was reordering too much or things like that. But when you have a situation where the answer is to throw money at the problem and you've got somebody <laughs> there and who's anxious to take your money, exactly. uh, that, that could be a recipe for disaster. Um, are there any kind of nuggets of just, Hey, if you are making this transition, whether it be an inventory or mm-hmm. just how you're thinking about things, what should people make sure they do or don't do? I am a big believer in investing in any kind of forecasting software in any way, shape or form. The more in tune you can be with those forecasts across the retailer platform and knowing how you plan that supply to your point. I think I think a lot of companies, people would be surprised you're still living in the Excel spreadsheets, even though how complex our businesses are. So if your business can afford to invest, make automation your best friend, there's other areas of the business to spend more time on strategy. And I think if you can really invest in the software for forecasting, it's going to be a game changer. And I think really just understanding the world of supply chain and the guidelines that each retailer is expecting you to perform at before you launch. I think it's extremely important to understand the compliance standards and they're all different, you know, so it's a lot of work to really learn what those are and understand them. But logistics teams, transportation teams, distribution teams, sales teams, get together, hold hands, <laughs> set some responsibilities and hold your teams accountable for making sure that you know what's in your supplier agreements. You don't want to be banging your head against the wall a year from now that you didn't do any of that due diligence and then you're paying for it. And it's really going to affect your margins down the road. And I think the more that you are aware of what those guidelines are, you're going to be in a much more profitable place across the board and in a healthier supply chain, which we can only hope for. <laughs> You know, I was just going to add to what Jessica said, because I completely agree. We work with a lot of different companies today and something that we see that really sets more sophisticated teams apart is just their willingness to cross lines, so to speak. Mm -hmm. This is aging me, but I've been doing this for a while. (laughs) But back when I was calling on Walmart and Sam's Club, sales did sales and the supply chain did supply chain. And my only job was to get the product in the door and like, good luck to the supply chain team. Hope you guys can fulfill those orders. Hope finance team can invoice and get all the dollars. (laughs) And you know, that it's really evolved nowadays to Jessica's point. And it's interesting because I feel like retailers are forcing that evolution a little bit. So when Walmart introduced on time in full, for example, or the SQEP supplier quality excellence program. These are now fines that are hitting sales and supply chain and finance teams. And so everyone is forced to have those conversations a little bit. It's not just, oh no, we got a fine or a deduction. We have to go fight that. It's Let's figure out why we got that and how can we prevent that from happening? So I think to Jessica's point is communicating across teams as early as you possibly can. So everyone is on the same page. And the only thing that I would add that I think is a little bit different than e-commerce going into brick and mortar is having a launch strategy is incredibly important. But having an exit strategy, I think, is something that a lot of teams don't think Uh, about. about What do you mean by that? Yeah. On e-commerce, the other name for it is the endless shelf, right? So as long as you have a website up, you can continue to sell the product. And obviously you can be smart about it. If it's not as popular, you can buy down inventory and things like that. At a company like Walmart or Target, it is not uncommon for them. If things aren't going as well as they hope, or you're not selling as much as they wish you would be, they can knock you off the shelf. And it's scary. A lot of times, It happens and a lot of teams don't have a lot of warning for that. And so do you have a plan in place for if Walmart were to cut your inventory tomorrow, what does that look like? Where are you going to sell that down? Do you have an exit strategy to make sure that you're able to still remain 
as profitable as possible? Or is it something where in inventory planning, you say, hey, we're going to not produce the entire year's worth of inventory all at once. We're going to stagger it. Whatever makes the most sense for your team, just think about what happens. If things go great, which we all hope happens, awesome. But if things don't go great, what is the plan to get out of it if that happens? I've seen that so many times where a small company will get lots of distribution with Walmart in particular, do well for a year or two. And then Walmart says, oh, thanks, but no thanks. And that <laughs> company's out of business because all their cash is tied up in the inventory. It can almost be the kiss of death. And I love that idea of kind of planning for an exit strategy. Definitely. And hopefully not pigeonholing your inventory to one retailer. Sometimes it happens, but hopefully you'll be able to move it around between retailers or to D to C hopefully. <laughs> Is there anything else like that when it comes to shipping or logistics from a strategy perspective? So you talked about being mindful of what you're producing, being mindful of making sure that you can sell the same SKU in different areas. What are the strategies do you see best in class brands handle? From a shipping perspective, I would say, again, this goes back to compliance. That's probably beating a dead horse, but I think it's something that's near and dear to us is what are the labeling standards for Amazon versus Walmart versus a Target? Really understanding what are the pallet requirements? There's tons of different, I think, things that logistic carriers expect, but it's also something that the retailer has specific expectations on. So Again, it's not going to be the same of what you're doing day to day with D to C. And the sooner that you can understand that, the better, because if not, again, it's going to be something that you're going to be deducted for in the future. So I think labeling is a big one that we constantly see, and those will unfortunately become even shorter deductions or substitution deductions. The more clear that you can make, let's say for Harry's razors, for instance, like all those are gonna look very similar in the way that they're packaged. So is it a just color sticker on the box? Talk to your carriers, talk to your 3PLs, make sure you're having these conversations that they understand what's being packaged and what's going out the door and it, are they receiving it appropriately? These are all the things that you need to do, I think in the very early days so that you understand that like things are coming through the pipeline appropriately. Stacey, I'm sure has some other nuggets. Too. Yeah, no, I, I think Jessica hit the nail on the head is just really understanding your business. Just as an example, Walmart has a, they call it the secondary packaging standards guide. It's about 200 pages, <laughs> which is insane, <laughs> but take the time to read through it. Because as Jessica said, like if you make a mistake across one item, but then you do it across however many SKUs you're sending across, however many DCs across however many stores, that problem can become really large, really fast. But I would add to what Jessica is saying, not only do you want to know things up front, but also adopting a mindset of continuous learning. We say at Supply Bike, deductions and fines are just indicators of what is happening further up in your supply chain. So obviously do everything you can to get everything right the first time, but deductions, compliance, fines, those are inevitable. They are going to happen period, full stop, but learn from them, right? So make sure that you are working continuously with your teams to understand, again, why did we get this deduction? How often are we getting this deduction? Not only by count, but what's really impacting us monetarily, because you may have a bunch of, let's say, invoice related deductions, but it's only costing you a tenth of a shortage related deduction, for example. Really digging into that and then translating what you're learning back across your teams to go, okay, guys, we're getting killed with shortage related deductions. It looks like it's code 22s and 24s. What can we do to examine what is happening further upstream? And I know Jessica has utilized like amazing workflows at Harry's, for example. Hey, if we see this sort of deduction happen at this retailer, this is the root cause and this is what we do about that. And I don't know if you wanted to kind of share that, Jessica. Yeah, I was going to also just add proof documentation. So whether or not your transportation is collect or prepaid, so collect world, you'll have bill of ladings. And on the prepaid side, you'll have proof of deliveries, PODs, keeping those in accessible manner so that in the future you can go back and say, no, we shipped you a hundred <laughs> cartons of this item. That is going to be extremely crucial for you to have that document in the future. So it's like storing those and working with your 3PLs and warehouses to maintain those, your carriers, in an easy, accessible manner and way indefinitely. 
is going to be money in the bank for your business and your supply chain team in the future. So I'd say if you don't currently have those or have access to them, find a way to get them, set up a process. It's going to help in the long run. So there's a better way than Gmail or Dropbox. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like them scanning them in manually and then emailing them to you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's always the funny thing is we work with so many suppliers and more often than not, it's just such an outdated process, unfortunately. Yes. And then I would just add the Stacey's point. Yeah, root causation is a big piece. And this is again, where I think Stacey was talking about um, the teams and supply chain teams of the future, not being afraid to cross those lines between teams and working collectively. And I think that's the only way in which your business is going to operate in a healthy manner and really make sure that you're operating as efficiently as possible and communicating what's going on. Because if not, and you're just in these silos, no one knows what's going on and you're not fixing anything, even when you know you have these deductions and fines that are those signals telling you what's going on. So making sure that a problem comes in, you get a fine and you go, what happened? Okay, we shipped this late, but who shipped it late? Is it the carrier's fault? Did we route it incorrectly internally when we were creating that order? And then keeping track of that and then trying to apply that solution to not just that retailer. If your chances are, if you're doing that one thing for that one retailer, you might be doing that same thing across other retailers. So applying that to the rest of your business to learn how can we make our process more efficient and hopefully stop that problem in the front end so that you're not having to face it down the road again. But a new supply chain problem will probably be coming soon. So <laughs> only another thing for us to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call job security. <laughs> exactly. It, it's so interesting because I think a lot of times people may think, oh, I'm selling shampoo or whatever widget I have on my e-commerce site. It's the exact same thing. Just instead of shipping a, a unit, I'm shipping pallets to a Walmart or Target. But it's really a completely different playbook and completely different pressures and issues. I want to dig into deductions a little bit more, but before we do that, I want to just talk a little bit about returns. And when you're doing an e-commerce site, you're typically dealing with a single unit return. Maybe it's the wrong size, things like that. But that's not the case in retail. Can you just talk a little bit about where the returns come <laughs> to place? And they're a little bit different than e-commerce. I can start, Jessica, if you yeah. want to add on. But yeah. yeah, so to your point, Aaron, you're right. When you're on the e-commerce, C2C side, it is a lot more kind of onesie, twosies. As you send it to customers, they'll return it if it doesn't work out for whatever reason. With mass retailers, obviously different story. You can get returns across their entire store network. And it really depends on which retailer you're working with. I know Jessica and I are just more broken records here, but really making sure you understand in your supplier agreement, how those returns are meant to be processed. And I'll just use Walmart just because they're the big elephant in the room, but obviously it'll be similar for other brick and mortar retailers. But generally speaking, as an example for Walmart, when it comes to returns, you have the ability to have it returned to you. You can donate it or you can destroy it in the field. That's up to your company. Generally speaking, companies that have larger, more expensive items, obviously like TVs or things like that, they want them returned to them. If it's smaller items, phone cases, styluses, whatever it is, then usually those get donated or destroyed in field. I think the big glaring difference to, to know about if you're not already thinking about or dealing with this is many retailers will have what they call a defective allowance. And basically what you are negotiating with the retailer is you're saying you're an agreed upon amount that you think will either be damaged, basically unsellable, either damaged or returned to you. So let's just say, for example, you guys agree that you want your DA defective allowance to be 5%. Generally, how that's going to work is you're going to invoice Walmart in this example. You're going to give them a 5% discount. Basically, it's that allowance. And the theory behind it is that's supposed to cover any of the returns or any of the unsellable merchandise. If you go above that 5%, so let's just say for whatever reason, a lot of bottles got broken in shipment or whatever it is, and they couldn't sell 10%, then Walmart will actually invoice you for that difference. So they'll say, hey, we thought we were gonna be able to sell 5%, turns out we can't sell 10%, so now we need you to make up that difference. In theory, uh, <laughs> if your returns are less than the 5%, they're supposed to true that up the other way and write you a check. I will say in my 12 years, I have never seen that happen. I will say never. <laughs> but I've seen suppliers utilize that in other ways. So they'll negotiate and say, hey, obviously I'm a best-in-class supplier. We don't have any returns issues. We have great products. Could you 
increase my distribution? Could you add additional items of mine to your assortment? Could you come up with more favorable payment terms and things like that? I know I just dumped a lot of information, but I think it's important to realize that it's a totally different beast. Yeah, it sounds like you're paying a 5% bribe for them to maybe not return stuff. But like, <laughs> you're hoping. It's, it's so wild because there can be returns because the end consumer returned it, but mm -hmm. they also return stuff because, hey, this didn't sell as much. We bought too much, so here, take it back. And that's the stuff that just blows my mind is that this is not only accepted, but this is meant to be best in class. Yep, exactly. And I think just to add on to Stacey's point and think like when you return and receive a lot of those returns, if you're a business that has that agreement with one of the retailers, then you have the added complexity of restickering all your product, relabeling it, repackaging it, the cost of transportation back to your DC then back out to another retailer potentially. So all of that, I think you need to also just keep in mind the time it's going to take to do that and really doing those cost exercises of what's really going to make us the most money here. Is it even worth it for us to bring this inventory back? Because it's probably going to be really expensive to do all that. To your point, that 5% bribe, that just covers the cost of goods sold. It doesn't cover any of the other logistics costs. And things exactly. Oh, Aaron, they'll charge it for free. <laughs> That's in your supplier agreement. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So let's dig deeper into deductions. What other stuff is out there that an e-commerce brand, what is this? Yeah. So I would say stating the obvious, the really big difference is when you're an e-commerce brand and Jessica, obviously hop in, if I'm saying anything incorrectly, you're interfacing invoicing directly with a customer, right? So in theory, 99% of the time, it's going to go right. They order something online, you invoice them, they pay for it, they receive it. Everyone is happy. And that's the end of that story. And it's great. With mass retailers, there's a whole kind of underbelly there on the finance side around deductions. So, you know, really there's two types of ways they can honestly ding you. So one of them is called accounts payable deductions, or we call them off invoice deductions. So basically Walmart orders a hundred cases, you ship them a hundred cases, you invoice them for a hundred cases somewhere it gets lost in the ether <laughs> and Walmart decides they're not going to pay you for those hundred cases. They may say, oh, we only received 80 or whatever it is. And so essentially an off invoice deduction, exactly what it sounds like, they will choose to not pay you in full for whatever you're invoicing. Walmart, for example, has about 75 codes they can go after you for. Target has about 40, Kroger has eight, so on and so forth. The Mafia does a similar sort of shakedown. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's called a security money. Here. And so AP deductions, huge part of what we see in our day to day. If you are selling to a brick and mortar retailer, you are getting AP deductions. It's just a matter of how much. And then on the other side, yet other ways they can ding you, accounts receivable, deductions. And essentially that is when the retailer invoices you. And generally that's more around compliance programs. So a lot of retailers, they will set up kind of compliance programs. I Jessica mentioned a couple like On Time in Full or the SQEP program. In theory, a lot of these programs are meant to strengthen the supply chain for retailers. So from obviously, yes, from their perspective. Yes. So for example, on time in full for Walmart, their rules are you have to be 98% on time, 98% in full. So if I order a hundred cases to arrive on Wednesday, a hundred cases need to arrive on Wednesday. And their logic is if you aren't fulfilling it completely or if it's getting there early or late, that is basically going to impact their ability to make the sale and their ability to make the customer happy. And again, in theory, in an ideal world, all of this makes sense and it tracks, but I think where it all starts to fall apart is the supply chain, we all know, and again, stating the obvious, it's just not the most efficient. And more often than not, which is scary and sad, a lot of these deductions and compliance fines end up being invalid. So it really was a receiving error. They miscounted it because it's some 19 year old kid scanning boxes in a warehouse at three in the morning. So they miscounted a, a PO or a pallet or whatever it is. And then what happens is a lot of these retailers, they take the money first, and you are guilty before proven innocent. So definitely not a US court of law. They take the money and it's on you to go back and say, no, as Jessica mentioned, the proof of delivery or the bills of lading, it's on you to go to Walmart, Target, Kroger, Amazon, whoever it is and say, 
hold on, you did get the full 100. Here's that POD or VOL, you need to pay me back in full. But it's a painful process, unfortunately. Yeah. And the amount of time that the supply chain org is having to spend to validate all of that is so inefficient. Like the teams need to be getting product out the door. And I think there's a lot of time that the teams have to take to investigate all of what's going on, which for better or worse, right? I think it does make those supply chains healthier to Stacey's point. Like we need to be investigating what's going on because if it is something we're doing wrong, we're probably doing it against all these other retailers. So let's fix it. But also there's times where the retailer did something wrong. So there's a lot of time kind of being spent to Stacey's point on that validation piece, but extremely crucial part. And if you're not doing that today, spend the time. It's worth it for your business to make sure that your business is running smoothly and your supply chain is as healthy as one can hope. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just, I'm doing the math here in my head and let me know if this tracks. So if I've got a D to C brand and I have an AOV of hundred dollars, that's what I collect and sell. I start out with hundred dollars. That's the maximum I can charge because Walmart target isn't going to want to have a more expensive on shelf price than what they have online and they need a, let's call it 50% margin. Now I'm only getting $50 for that thing that was $100. And then I have to pay a 5% bribe so that things don't get returned. <laughs> and then they're gonna take away some stuff because they miscounted and they're saying mm -hmm. I'm short. Yep. And then they may say, hey, the ship didn't ship on time. And so there's further things are put. It seems like it's almost a raw deal here. Do D 2 C brands make money in retail? I do think that they do. And I think honestly, the best in class suppliers are getting ahead of these issues and also having the leverage to create healthier and stronger supplier agreements. As I think at Harry's, we talked about this a lot where we'd want to go to Target and just tell them like, oh, you maybe did this or this wrong. And it's like, wait, let's like clean up our house first to our best ability and that we know before we have those conversations. And when we feel like we've really made our supply chain as efficient as possible, and we feel like our process is really efficient, then let's have those conversations. So I think like you're able to negotiate those agreements and you're able to have, to Stacey's point, some of those allowances that we have and lower them down. Like I think like in the beginning when you're a new supplier, they're probably going to be a little bit higher than what you would be if you're a P and G or J and J or someone who's going to obviously be able to provide that best in class experience. But I do think it all comes down to automation, efficiency, really investing in your supply chain, making sure those teams are speaking to each other and having that communication is the key. We see it so many times, finance teams not talking to supply chain teams, and there's these huge disconnects. And I think the world of deductions and compliance and the world of retail is forcing these teams to have to be communicating all the time. You're working kind of hand in hand. Why send product out in the supply chain and then finance is going to get this deduction? Let's all work together to make sure that we're going to be profitable. So I think that's really the key. I would agree. And the only thing I would add to that is, again, Jessica and I are broken records. <laughs> we are going to bang this drum is really understand what you are getting into. Because a lot of times what we see is uh, new brands, they have their one SKU, Walmart said yes, and they're so excited and we're really excited for them too. But they don't realize on average, and for you guys listening, on average, we see suppliers get hit with about 6% off invoice for deductions. And again, this is something Walmart just takes. And it's on you to go get that back if you can. In addition to the 5% bribe. Yep. Yep. <laughs> the effective allowance, which you're just going to give, you're just going to give it. You have to. Then on average, they take about 6% for deductions. So that's fun. Um, and then different, again, different retailers have different compliance programs, but I keep harping on Walmart just because they're so big, but an example for Walmart, if you're not on time in full for every non-compliant case, you get hit with a 3% cost of goods sold. So it's kind of like when you drive a new car off the lot, it's like the second a product, you get that PO for that product and you ship it, you're about 10 to 12% in the hole, just like that. Now, obviously some of that is recoverable. As long as you're shipping well, you can avoid some of those things. As Jessica said, the longer you're there, you can negotiate some of that down. But again, I feel like a lot of retailers, like they don't really expose this beforehand. And so when you invoice Walmart and suddenly you're getting 15% less than you expect it to get, it's a big deal for a lot of, especially smaller suppliers that don't have the ability to just float that cash. And then Aaron, as you mentioned, a lot of that cash is tied up in inventory or whatever it is. And now it's a 60 to 90 day time period to go get that money back. And what are you going to do? So just really making sure that you know all of this <laughs> beforehand. So when it comes, you have a plan. 
and you're not surprised and you're baking that into your cost of goods when you're pitching to Walmart and Target and Amazon and all these places. Yeah, and that's huge. I think for a brand to just assume that whatever price they agree on, they're also implicitly giving 12% back. That's a really helpful heuristic for people to take into it. What does that metric look like with Supply Pike? Great question. It depends. Obviously, we work with different suppliers at different kind of parts of their journey. I would say best in class, and Jessica, you can talk about how Harry's looked at it, but best in class is you usually want to be about 1% or less. So we work with our suppliers, obviously, again, this is on average, but when they come in, they're usually at about 6% and we usually are able to help them get down to about two to 3% just by giving them insight into their root cause, helping them just get the money back to start. That's table stakes, but then understanding long-term how you prevent that from happening again, basically stop the bleeding, so to speak. I don't know, Jessica, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I was just going to add there's companies that we work with as high as 10%. So I think it's also (laughs) frightening to know that, but I think it's somewhere to start, right? And it's something that needs to be focused on and the time and attention needs to be spent there. I think a lot of companies wait too long and then they're in the whole 10%. When it's What are we waiting for? The sooner we can understand what's going on in the business, the sooner we're going to be more profitable. So yeah, at Harry's, I think we were able to reduce it. And I think it really was because we brought Supply Pike software on, we were able to automate the process, get money back, but also spend the time on root causation, really investing the time in the supply chain, understanding what was going on, understand the nuance of Walmart versus Target versus Amazon. They're not the same. They're very different. And making sure that you're catering to that, we have to, or you shouldn't be. You just shouldn't be in those businesses because if you're going to treat them all the same, you're going to feel that cost on the other side. And then what's the point? You're not making any money and you're not going to be profitable there. And I think it's for the customer too, and that relationship with the retailer, showing them that you care and showing them that you understand the guidelines of their business. And then that's only going to help improve that relationship and hopefully negotiate those other terms over time to be more profitable, get more shelf space, whatever it may be that you want out of them as well. Yeah. It reminds me, I was talking to a brand a couple of weeks ago and it was a DSC brand that had gotten into Target. It was their big deal. They're super happy with it. But they ended up getting so much deductions and so many delays in payments beyond just the payment terms that they were like, I think Target's going to put us out of business. And yeah. it was just this terrible thing that like, I feel like I have to cut two or $3 million worth of revenue just so I have a viable cash solution for what we're doing. It was definitely something that kind of stuck with me. It's mm-hmm. like how difficult retail can be, especially for a small, nimble company that's just on the up and up. Definitely. Because you think you need more hands to be able to understand what's going on in those small companies I feel for because they're just trying to get product out the door and they don't have time to read the 200 page compliance documents. It's okay. Chat GPT is going to take care of all that. Oh, yeah. True. No, I think, Eric, you bring up a really great point. And it's something that obviously we talked about our software and kind of what we do is we really help to automate the deductions recovery, which is really cool. But the part that I really wanted to talk about that I'm so proud of is so we actually have a completely free education arm called Supplier Wiki, where we have a lot of free articles, resources, eBooks, and things like that on how you can be a best in class supplier. We love partnering with companies like ISBA because I think the three of us can all agree, like, it is dang near impossible to find any sort of actual helpful information about being a supplier online. Like most of the time you learn because you've done it for 10 years or somebody who can show you how to run that one report in retail link or whatever it is, you're not going to get this support. And so I think it's really cool that slowly but surely this ecosystem of education is coming up to help suppliers. And it's really cool. But I mean, even what y'all do at ISBA as well. Stacey, you bring up such a good point about that as well. I think if you're a new D2C brand going into the world of retail, I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways I had when I started with Harry's was there's not going to be like a person that gets on the phone with you or an email to help you answer a lot of those questions that you're wondering on the supply chain side of what do I do if this happens? That doesn't really exist. They have some customer service lines and emails and stuff, but to actually have a physical human being to come back and have a conversation with you is extremely rare. So if you do find a contact or if you have contacts in your network, like use them. It's extremely helpful. And of course, the shameless plug of supplier wiki, I found as a client too, like in my time, just to have something defined super clearly that is not in like the jargon of the 200 page document that could tell me like, 
this is what this code is. This is how you <laughs> fix it. That is priceless, I think, in just being able to solve a problem quickly and move on. Yeah, it's funny. I just think about how many brokers or sales companies have been started just because so and so worked at Target and yep. and know the buyers personally. So, uh, yeah. Just to wrap up, I'd love to kind of get your guys' perspective on how retail changed over the last three years. If I think about the last 10 years, there was this discussion about, oh, retail is dead. DDC is going to intermediate the middleman. It's all going to go away. And that kind of happened a little bit, but then retail came back and then COVID happened and it felt like it fell off the cliff for a bit. But now it seems that the pendulum has swung from D2C over to retail. Yeah. How do you guys see the last three years and what do you think the next three years look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I can take the first stab at it. I think to retail's credit, I think they've done a lot of things to try and match again, that quote unquote, endless shelf experience. So for it, and I think COVID actually did really help that resurgence because everyone was trapped in the house for a year and a half. I probably had an Amazon package at my door, like every day for a year. I'm sure my husband was like, there's nothing left in the world to buy. And so I think a lot of people wanted to get back out into the world and have that shopping experience. But again, a lot of retailers that we see are really trying to replicate again, that online experience. Again, I know I keep harping on Walmart, but just to give you guys an example. So Walmart recently introduced a program, they call it item swap or quick mods. And basically, so this is slightly scary. If you guys are thinking about going into retail, more things to think about, but before when you pitched to Walmart and let's say you got the business, generally speaking, your business was pretty protected for usually about a year, right? So you'd go in, you'd pitch your goods, Walmart's sure, I'll have you in my stores for a year, awesome. But Walmart has recently introduced again, the item swap quick mods, where they're actually able to swap products out with essentially almost no notice to you. So they can usually, I think, give you about a week's, or not a week's, about a month's notice. But then after that, you're off shelf. The idea behind it is that it's supposed to allow them to capture more viral trends. So obviously, we all know I am also shamelessly on TikTok way too much. <laughs> but as suddenly this product ABC is super popular on TikTok, before Walmart really wouldn't be able to capture that because again, your space on the shelf is just there. Now, now, again, in service of customers, they're trying to say, hey, this product is really trending on TikTok. This lipstick is this other lipstick that is not moving as fast. You're out now and we want to make place for this brand new viral item. So from a Walmart perspective, huge win. Obviously, they're capturing that sale from a customer. Even honestly, from a customer perspective, huge win, too, because now I can go to a Walmart and pick up whatever I want. From the supplier perspective, terrifying. Absolutely terrifying because again, that inventory that you thought would sustain you or you'd have whatever it is for three months, six months, nine months, you can now get kicked out with one month. So again, talking about that exit strategy that we talked about earlier. So yeah, not to be a doomsday, <laughs> but only to say, I think brick and mortar is again, they're evolving to try and match the speed of online. Yeah. It's also presents a bit of an opportunity, right? If yes. they're swapping somebody out, it means they're swapping somebody in. What yes. are you seeing brands do to make sure that they're top of mind? Because it seems so much, hey, I've got a broker, they're working for a year to just get that meeting. And maybe it's a sales cycle or line review twice a year. And then you're finally in there and then they're going to swap you out after a quarter. <laughs> like, How do you make sure you're top of mind so that when something does go viral or you're successful in driving traffic to your D2C site, you're able to say, hey, hey, break me in now. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great question. And I love that we're making this like a full circle discussion because it's back to what we were talking about earlier is just making sure that you are the dominant voice in the brand, in the category, whatever it is, and really investing. Like it or not, social media is really driving a lot of kind of product adoption. And so making sure that you have a presence on social media to be present, be top of mind and all that good stuff. And I think too, kind of something that's interesting is I have worked with a lot of brands that started as e-commerce only. They leverage that data with the Walmart and with the targets of the world to say, hey, on average, we are selling, what are my units, quote unquote, units per store per week? What is the unit velocity? What are the margins? I think the cool thing about e-commerce is you can capture a lot of like demographic data that you miss in brick and mortar. So even being able to understand and share demographic information, we tend to do really well with this age group in this area of the country, whatever it is. 
a lot of these brick and mortar stores will actually trait their stores and you can be very strategic. We talked about inventory planning, even about what stores you should be in. The joke we like to do is if you are a scuba or snorkel type seller, don't trait or don't recommend your products to be in Arkansas. <laughs> that doesn't really make sense, but you can utilize that data in a really smart way to be strategic, to not have so much a huge capital outlay, make sure you're maximizing your impact at the stores that you choose to be in and really utilize e-commerce, I think, to your advantage. Yeah. And just if you add to that. Yeah, I was going to just add, I think just coming out of the world of COVID from like a supply chain perspective, it's also the lead time in which you can actually react and create new products and making sure you're investing in d domestic distribution centers and production. If you're able to produce here, we saw what happened during COVID and internationally trying to get product over here and the ports being congested and factories shutting down because of COVID restrictions and guidelines. And I think a lot of companies have really seen, okay, let's open up a factory here. Let's cut the lead time down in half. Let's be able to react and, oh, this, we saw this trend happening. Let's see if we could produce a new product and get it on shelf quickly because we want to service that retailer and that new customer in a way that we never have before. And I think it just is really a great way to be able to be more agile within the world of supply chain to be able to say, hey, we can ship this now and produce it, get it out in three months versus in a year. <laughs> like it's something that I think we're forced to do now and that the world of supply chain and these D2C brands need to think about if they're really looking to invest in the world of retail and think about how they can react quickly. Yeah, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Jessica. Any last words of wisdom about D2C brands making the jump into retail? All I would say is it can be scary, but I think it's worth it. Just the ability to get national distribution and get your name out there. It's almost like a reaffirming circle where the more you're out in the large retailer, that drives business to other kind of less basic SKUs on your website and so on and so forth. And I would just say, know what you're getting into, <laughs> read those 200 page documents or work with teams that will do that for you, <laughs> whichever makes the most sense. Make sure you're leveraging the data that you have from e-commerce when you're going into line reviews or meet meetings with buyers and have fun. It's a crazy world, but it's super rewarding when you walk into the kind of fortune number one and you see your brand on shelf. Uh, it's a pretty cool experience, but yeah, that's all I've got. <laughs> yeah. It seems plus one to all of that. And I think really just investing in your supply chain, I would say overall, it's become more and more important. And I think what we've learned is the retailers are only getting more strict and having more compliance guidelines. So the more that you can really understand what that is and get ahead of it, or like Stacey said, invest in brokers or anyone that knows about it, learn who those customers are, really trying to understand who they are to show up in your best way possible for your brand specifically. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Erin.